All right, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. This is a Great Lakes Rota RC presentation, um, the title of which uh, I think we have a little bit of a change to that. So I'm gonna give you our technical title that Randy was so kind to give us, which is the research on psychedelic compounds and the treatment of substance use disorders. Our session today is being hosted by the UW-Madison Division of Extension. So I wanna take a minute to thank the university for hosting our presenter and our presentation today. Um, I'll be your host. My name is Amanda Curra. I'm the regional project manager. Uh, before we get into our session, I just have a few quick housekeeping items to address. So if you've been with us before, you know how we go. All right, I'm gonna start by talking about our funding acknowledgement. And that's just to let you know that we are a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration project or a SAMHSA project. Uh, we cover hum Health and Human Services Region 5, which is Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. So if you're outside that region, we're glad to have you. We're happy to have anyone join our, our series to learn with us and to share with us. Um, but we're, just to let you know that that's what our particular rota covers. There are nine other rotas throughout the United States. If you don't know your rota, let us know and we'll be happy to get you connected. Uh, you can learn more about our rota at the following website and we'll be putting it up later in the series today. Within our rota, uh, we provide virtual and or on-demand education, evidence-based resources and research, as well as technical outreach to professionals working in and with rural communities. Moving on now, I just wanna tell you a little bit about our website. Uh, that's a connection to our resource library. That is uh, information about our TTCs uh, that connect us, rural health, community toolkits and resources, video podcasts, supportive apps. Um, we're constantly working on our website, adding new and, and more resources all the time. So please make sure you take a minute to just check us out. We're gonna move now and just prepare for uh, the content that we're about to hear today. And that means just getting ourselves ready to listen and engage in the session content. So before we begin, we wanna just take a moment to promote the use of pers affirming person first language when discussing behavioral health disorders. As we create that environment of learning together, we want to feel welcoming and safe for everyone. So let's just work together to manage the space that we're in that supports that non-stigmatizing recovery oriented language that can help reduce that negative bias and promote engagement. As always, we invite you to learn about successful prevention, treatment, and recovery from whatever space that you're joining us from today. And we welcome you formally into the Great Lakes Rota RC community of learning. We ask you to just take a moment to make sure that you are, your screen is muted, that your video is on if you care to. If you have it off, that's okay. Um, but it's always nice for our presenters to see the faces of the people that they're connecting with today. Um, as we connect in, um, if you have questions or comments, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Myself um, and Dr. Park Marock will manage the chat and we'll make sure that Dr. Brown gets those questions as they come up. Featuring now um, our presenter, Dr. Brown, uh, serves as a consulting physician in addiction medicine at UW Hospital, where he is the director of the, for the Center of Addictive Disorders at the UW HIV AIDS Comprehensive Care Center and at the UW Multidisciplinary Clinic for Alcohol-Related Liver Disease. He has been a certified prescriber of bunaprenephrine as adjunctive treatment for opioid dependence since 2001. He is also the founding director of the UW Addiction Medicine Fellowship Program and the director of the Madison VA Interprofessional Advanced Fellowship in Addiction Treatment. I turn it over to Dr. Brown now. Right. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction and for inviting me to be here today to talk a little about uh, this topic. Um, I've been involved in this work for, for a little over 10 years now, and it's really been an interesting and wonderful journey, and look forward to sharing a bit about it with you all today. Um, we'll be talking about psychedelic compounds, but really some historical literature around other substances, but pretty squarely focused on psilocybin for the most part, as that's where um, a lot of the action has been by way of scientifically rigorous research recently. 
Um, I do receive funding from a number of private organizations that support that work here at University of Wisconsin and happy to answer any questions about that. So uh, given the nature of the group, I don't think I need to belabor points around how common uh, use disorders are um, in the United States with population-based surveys telling us that fully uh, 15 up to 20% of individuals will struggle with substance use at some point in their life. And that proportion is even higher if we're looking at folks that uh, report to primary care clinics or who are hospitalized. And so in my interaction with health professional trainees, students, residents, I'll frequently indicate that if they've gone through a day caring for patients in the hospital and think that they haven't met anyone who's struggling with substance use, then they aren't asking the right questions. Um, heavy costs associated, as you can see there, and, and unfortunately, uh, though effective treatments are available, um, they're, they're fairly rarely accessed. Um, and particularly our, our residents in our rural areas um, can really have some some struggles so far as that goes. And so we really have some work to do on this front by way of implementation and dissemination um, and enhancing effectiveness. Because uh, even where FDA approved medications are available and counseling that's known to be effective, uh, keeping folks retained in treatment for periods of time that are sufficient to lead to sustained rates of recovery can be a real challenge. And that's where... Um, we started developing some interest in the potential of these psychedelic compounds to um, enhance psychological shifts and sorts of realizations around behavior change that may enhance desire to, to remain in those treatments. And I'll be talking a little bit about, so more specifically about the kinds of shifts that I'm referring to you know, when I'm talking about that. So when we're talking about psychedelics, um, the roots, get to this definition that you see here, psychedelic being characterized as something mind manifesting or capability revealing or having useful or beneficial properties of the mind. It was coined by Osmond in his work in 1957. And when we're talking about psychedelics, there are a few that get lumped into this category. Um, we refer to as classic psychedelics as they operate through a particular receptor in the brain, um, a serotonergic receptor, 5-HT2A uh, receptor that's responsible, um, at least in some part, perhaps not 100%, but in some part for their subjective effects. Um, and some other terminology, sometimes folks will kind of lump all of these things into a category of hallucinogens, which isn't necessarily strictly accurate. Um, is MDMA, for example, is, is included in this category of psychedelics, but doesn't really occasion distortions in perception of reality that, that goes along with a hallucinogenic kind of effect and is more accurately referred to, for example, as entheogen or something um, that, quote, generates God or the divine within and are substances that are characterized by a facilitation of reduced anxiety, particularly in the context of interpersonal relationships um, that sought to potentially have some benefit, for example, in the setting of PTSD and counseling related to that condition where um, it can be a real challenge for, for individuals struggling with that condition to engage in a deep way with counseling just due to the nature of the, the history with that, with that condition. Um, so you can see some of what we're talking about when we're talking about um, the classic psychedelics here by way of what they look like. You can see some of the similarities there between, for example, LSD and psilocybin. Um, and I mentioned the receptor through which they work. And one way this has been demonstrated is this substance ketanserin, which is a substance that goes to and blocks that receptor as opposed to what the psychedelics do, which is go to that receptor and switch it on. Um, and if, um, this is primarily looked at in animal models, the ketanserin blocks uh, sort of the effect um, or the behaviors you tend to see in animals if they're, they're experiencing the subjective effects of a classic psychedelic. Um, through that interaction with the 5-HT2A receptor, these are some of the terms that um, have been used by participants in these studies um, 
and researchers kind of trying to fully characterize what all goes into that accept that subjective experience. So ineffability, uh, participants going through these subjective experiences frequently have a very difficult time um, attaching language to what they went through. Um, and hence that's a little bit of a process with some of this work that I'll be talking about in a little bit as folks receive a supervised dose of psilocybin in the presence of mental health professionals, part of the process thereafter um, is helping them interpret and attach meaning to what they experienced um, that may serve them going forward. People will frequently report uh, a sense that they have had connection with some form of ultimate truth or um, a noetic quality, having achieved some special sort of knowledge about uh, universal truths. Um, and so in that context, they may find that their sense of self dissolves to a certain extent, and they experience more feeling a part of something larger than themselves. Um, transcendence of space and time or sort of challenges tracking it, uh, deeply felt positive mood, and a sense of connecting with something that's sacred um, are things that are that are reported by participants in the setting of these, again, supervised dosing sessions and in, in research. And while, you know, there had been some early research in this area in the 50s and into the 70s, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, just to give you some historical perspective on it, as uh, more modern studies started coming around, um, impact uh, in this early work was being seen in the early 2000s and really leading to a lot more interest in this area. And you can see here the extent to which uh, published research uh, in relation to these compounds is really growing fairly astronomically, uh, given what we've, what we've seen happen in the studies that have come so far. And so why do we think about it in particular in the setting of substance use disorders? You know, a lot of the early work um, that has been done and continues uh, in order to move toward FDA approval for MDMA and for psilocybin um, have been more in the setting of other uh, mental health issues such as anxiety, especially related to a terminal cancer diagnosis in the setting of psilocybin. Uh, and I'd already alluded to uh, PTSD, but there's some theoretical reasons where we might think that there could be applications in the setting of substance use disorder where individuals, again, have this subjective experience with those characteristics I alluded to earlier that seem to have fairly long-standing impact on some aspects of personality and being that in the personality literature once were thought to be immutable, unchangeable aspects of who a person was. And examples there include extroversion, openness, um, and greater willingness to explore new experience. Um, maybe thing and uh, an openness to solving problems in different ways uh, that may be fairly long standing after the experience itself, out to 12 months um, in the case of some of the work at Johns Hopkins, uh, where they looked at some of these construct on standardized questionnaires, again, around openness and um, engagement in community. So what exactly might be going on there that does that? What you're seeing here are um, kind of graphical representations. In this this picture on the left, um, how our brain tends to be connected when we're engaged in um, sort of routine tasks that aren't requiring kind of a lot of focus. So think about when you drive to work, you're tuning out a whole lot of what's going on around you in terms of stimuli, and that's Obviously, an ad, that's an adaptation with some advantages, because if we were distracted by all the activity around us, um, it would create some challenges by way of getting through that commute safely. And so this is referred to as the default mode network, or sort of the connections sort of within these hubs and between these different hubs in the brain um, that allow us to filter all that incoming stimulation um, and tend to a task at hand. Where 
what you see on the right here, um, where a participant has been administered psilocybin, is you see more of a breakdown of this connectivity within a node and a lot more talking across these centers um, that leads to, we think, some experiences like synesthesia referring to, um, for example, experiencing colors as tastes or sounds as smells. Um, and basically is referring to this sort of enhanced, again, connectivity, communication between neural centers that, again, may lead to um, some of the aspects of the experience I was referring to earlier, particularly ego dissolution and, and connection to things outside itself. So another question that I pretty frequently get, perhaps less so now, but certainly have gotten up quite a bit in the past, but boy, Dr. Brown, these are controlled substances and they're schedule one. So the DEA tells us that they're potentially habit forming and they don't really have any therapeutic value and they're probably dangerous. Um, but actually observational data from large studies um, seems to indicate that on the spectrum of um, recreational substances, they tend to be uh, fairly, well, lower risk than some others, um, including not having, not looking to have significant impact on mental illness for folks that are not at significant risk or currently struggling with such an issue. Uh, in fact, some studies have indicated that there is some advantage psychologically in terms of suicidal ideation um, another study that found reductions in uh, criminal behavior and recidivism among those who were criminal justice involved um, over a year's period of observation if they'd had a psychedelic experience. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about other potential adverse effects of um, psilocybin specifically as we're getting into some of the research that's been done, because I wouldn't go so far as to say there's no risk associated with some of these things. Uh, particularly if they're delivered under uh, uncontrolled circumstances. So there doesn't appear to be evidence of neurological damage, neurotoxic effects. We do pretty routinely see elevations in blood pressure and heart rate um, as psilocybin and MDMA, incidentally, are peaking. Um, and so that's one area where we're pretty careful screening participants. So those that are, have a significant cardiac history or uncontrolled blood pressure problems, um, that gives us pause by way of whether, um, you know, it's in their interest to participate in this work in terms of the risk. Um, there's, of course, when someone is under the influence of psilocybin, some impairment in judgment, and that's where, uh, again, part of the rationale for uh, having mental health professionals engaged with folks who are participating in this work. Um, and I'll be talking about this a bit more later, building relationship over the course of several hours prior to the dosing session to enhance um, safety. Um, there's a thing referred to as hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder. And it seems to be fairly low risk. You can um, think about it as something sort of akin to flashbacks when it's in its more severe um, sort of realm. But uh, we haven't seen a lot of this in modern studies. Uh, example, one participant sort of had disturbance perception of fluorescent light where they felt like they were seeing that flashing that fluorescent lighting does and finding that disturbing. And and those sorts of phenomena typically resolve within a week or two um, after the dosing session without more severe kinds of manifestations being present or persisting. And, uh, you know, we really, in modern studies, we've, we've been quite cautious um, around comorbid mental illness and administering these substances to, to individuals with potential risks, say, personal or even family history of psychotic disorders or, or bipolar disorder. And so um, still a bit of an open question as to the impact that these substances might have on, on populations answering that description, but we've been fairly cautious to date about, about that. So what do we deliver when we're um, delivering doses to people? So there have been some 
studies where it's been weight based and um so you do this sort of concentration 0.3 to 0.6 milligrams for every kilogram of body weight um but in those studies it looks like um the dose is pretty um pretty flat and so folks have taken to doing um more standard dosing with 25 milligrams being a fairly standard moderate kind of dose and as you're getting to 40 milligrams people thinking of that as higher doses potentially um creating more subjective effect depending on your population um you'll start seeing some effects as psilocybin in half an hour to an hour and some of those early effects um Folks might experience some anxiety, some paranoia. They may experience some nausea. Um, and so we have, again, the, the facilitators that are with folks supporting through that. Uh, peak effects tend to come on at about two hours. And studies have looked at anywhere from one to five doses that tend to be separated by about four weeks each uh, in modern studies. And we have folks under observation in a private room that has a private bathroom um, for anywhere close, usually closer to eight hours with sort of studies up to now, we're doing that. Um, so again, there's a lot of things built into these studies uh, by way of doing everything we can to guarantee safety for folks. Um, a lot of fairly detailed screening around mental health and physical health, again, I emphasized uh, you know, cardiac disease being something that we'd certainly want to know about and evaluate very carefully, uh, mental health conditions that might um, enhance risk for them having, you know, a bad subjective experience. Um, so the we, main, we maintain um, a study team that's working with a participant in the spirit of sort of helping them orient and um, ensuring expectancies are managed and they feel safe. So they have the same two facilitators who, again, are mental health professionals that are following them throughout typically three to four months of participation. And so ensuring that continuity, um, also ensuring continuity with uh, a study coordinator who's doing more of the data collection and shepherding them through the scheduling and things with studies. Uh, I think it's fairly important to, to maintain that. And so the facilitators are having fairly extensive contact with folks prior to dosing. Some of that are um, sessions around these assessments to make sure we feel like um, psilocybin can be safely administered. Uh, and then during the course of dosing day with psilocybin, the, the subjective effects are, are fairly profound. And so there really isn't a lot going on by way of active therapy by the mental health professionals during the course of dosing day. It's very much about facilitating inward focus. Um, so we'll often have the participant with eye shades on, um, classical music. We tend to avoid having music playing that has lyrics that might distract, again, from that inward focus over the course of the day. And we're fairly typically having folks uh, spend the night in these earlier studies uh, have been um, just to observe, make sure that they're not experiencing adverse effects overnight. Um, in the overnight hours, however, it's pretty typically simply been a bit of a headache uh, that resolves with simply Tylenol or ibuprofen um, or may continue to have some mildly elevated blood pressure that doesn't uh, typically require intervention. Um, so they may stay um, their psilocybin study so far. There's there's a dedicated clinical research unit at UW Hospital uh, where folks can spend the night with uh, nursing care there, 24 hours. Uh, the MDMA studies, they more typically were staying uh, at the dosing room in the School of Pharmacy, and we had night attendants in a room outside the dosing room, uh, making sure that, that they were okay. Uh, overnight. And then the following day gets to what we call the integration session uh, with the therapist that I was alluding to earlier that we um, think, though remains a bit of a question, but we do think that that's pretty important um, for participants to connect with those mental health professionals on that, again, to review their subjective experience during the day prior um, and help them discern what meaning uh, their subjective experience might have for them going forward. 
And so this is, uh, you can see a bit of a picture of what our session room looks like. And this is typically what sites are going for. They, you want it to be a nicely appointed room and, and not so much sort of a clinical hospital-y kind of setting uh, to enhance uh, comfort and a feeling of safety in the setting. Um, there's all the preparation or set that we talked about. So the screening, making sure we think that the risk benefit uh, balance is favorable for folks. Um, close follow-up with uh, mental health professionals and the setting with their their facilitators or their ther therapists present um, in a safe, secure, and private room. Again, you don't see it in this picture because it's sort of in the back corner, but there's a private bathroom there. So uh, they aren't having to wander into the halls of the school of pharmacy to find a public restroom or anything like that. And folks are encouraged to bring personal objects that they feel like might be comforting to them during the course of the day as well. Um, I already made mention of a good deal of this with psilocybin. Again, the, um, the experience is less sort of directive psychotherapy and more about encouraging the participant um, through this inward focus during the course of the peak effects of psilocybin and relaxing into that with the therapist there to provide support and reassurance if they do start with those peak effects of psilocybin, uh, feeling anxiety that's uncomfortable for them or, or paranoia. Um, the facilitators really are, are a key part of supporting folks through that. And while we have medications on hand uh, in the dosing room, uh, that can be administered if people are having a particularly challenging experience. We Our experience so far has been that we really haven't had to use any of that. And in several hundred participants who have gone through it, it's only been a handful, less than five, where any sort of intervention like that has been needed. Um, and I put up challenging experience just to express, you know, um, while I was alluding to a lot around the subjective experience that can be positive and that can relate to sustained benefit later. Folks who have challenging experience will still indicate that it was one of the most uh, spiritually intense um, experiences of their lives. And even if they were having challenges during the course of the dosing day, will still um, often endorse it as something that was helpful to them in uh, producing behavior change or um, shifts in their outlook later. Um, as we shift a bit more specifically into um, research on these count compounds in relation to use disorders, um, I think it's interesting to note that some of the, the earliest promotion of a possible role for psychedelics in the setting of use disorders um, was put out there by Bill W., one of the founders of 12-step programs. Um, and you can see some of the quotes here um, where he initially felt like there could be some significant potential for, at the time, LSD in particular, uh, to facilitate breakthroughs and treatment engagement that could be beneficial down the line. Um, and I'm not sure, I got to say, I'm not sure historically uh, what led to the break with that and um, promotion of abstinence from all substances uh, that are controlled, such as these, but... Um, as you likely know, that is a shift that occurred down the road. So uh, specifically in the setting of substance use disorders, um, alcohol actually, uh, and alcohol use disorders does have a bit of a history um, in the 1950s to 1970s, uh, where a meta-analysis of all of those studies um, with a focus on the randomized controlled trials was looked at and did uh, land on it looking like there seems to be a consistent effect for alcohol misuse when psilocybin is compared to placebo with quite a significant p-value you can see there. Um, and one of the leaders in modern studies around alcohol use disorder, um, Michael Bogenschutz, he started this work at University of New Mexico um, with his pilot work that since moved to New York University. Um, and you can see that he was able to safely administer psilocybin to uh, 10 individuals. Again, this was weight-based uh, with two doses and found there to be fairly significant decreases uh, lasting 36 weeks 
come out from those two dosing sessions. And he later followed up on that work, uh, that single arm study administering psilocybin to all participants to a randomized control trial comparing um, psilocybin to active placebo. Um, and you can see here, I think the thing that's interesting about this graph to note is that when people come into the study, you see that there's this drop in alcohol use right away before they even receive psilocybin, right? So there's some there's some active ingredient in the counseling that's going on uh, prior to the dosing. But then with the dose, you see this ongoing decline um, in numbers of drinking days in the psilocybin group that exceeds that in the placebo group and that you see fairly well sustained um, out to 36 weeks with a placebo control here in the Bogan shoot study being diphenhydramine or, or Benadryl. Uh, when it comes to other substance use disorders, there really isn't a lot out there yet. Um, there's one study in the U.S. Public Health Services Hospital in Lexington uh, looking at hypnosis plus psychedelic or LSD, um, where Ludwig did find some uh, enhanced substance use reduction when, excuse me, both hypnosis and LSD were administered in the setting of opioid use disorder. Um, the Savage and McCabe study where folks were randomized to an abstinence-based care um, versus LSD and found fairly significant increases in abstinence for the intervention group in that study. But that's about what's been out there uh, to now. And folks are pretty actively working on sort of more modern work, including our shop here at UW. Um, here you can see some of our coordinators and um, our, our therapists or facilitators that do a lot of this work, Paul Hudson in our School of Pharmacy, who does a lot of the heavy lifting with regulatory stuff, as you might imagine, with studies involving a Schedule One substance. There's a fair number of hoops to jump through by way of uh, the DEA and the FDA ensuring that what you're doing is is above board and that you have that you have appropriate focus on uh, safety for for people that are collaborating on this research. And so one study we're, we're in the midst of now is looking at psilocybin in the setting of opioid use disorder. Um, and as you likely know here, there are a um, couple uh, FDA approved and efficacious medications, particularly methadone and buprenorphine. Uh, now trexone can reduce craving and use in appropriately selected folks, but it's much more difficult for, for people to get onto. But methadone, buprenorphine, we know are are life-saving and improve a, a host of other outcomes, um, including bloodborne virus transmission, such as hepatitis C and HIV, uh, proportion of income derived from criminal behavior, things like that. But um, a challenge still is the extent to which folks uh, remain in that treatment for periods of time that are consistent with uh, more sustained recovery down the line. And so we're we're thinking and work we do that perhaps the shifts in thinking and behavior occasioned by psilocybin uh, might foster enhanced engagement in uh, treatment or other activities that are um, associated with use reduction. And so um, we've been therefore again, theorizing that uh, psilocybin might enhance uh, that treatment retention. Um, we initially had thought, boy, you know, I wonder if maybe the experience occasioned by psilocybin could lead folks to thinking about abstaining completely. And maybe we can do kind of an abstinence-based model, but particularly with fentanyl uh, predominance out there on the landscape, the risk for overdose is so high with even brief periods of abstinence that we really felt like um, you know, the first stages really need to be to stabilize folks on an accepted medication, um, in the case of this study, buprenorphine, um, and ensure psilocybin um, in combination with buprenorphine um, is an acceptable um, procedure to go through for folks and really take it from there because that, that interaction hasn't been looked at really carefully as yet. So what we're aiming to do is... Uh, 
recruit 10, 12 individuals um, to go through. We start them on a buprenorphine regimen by myself or another colleague in addiction medicine, get things stable on that, go through your usual set um, in that appropriate and supportive setting, um, and administer two doses of psilocybin um, under those conditions. And we're keeping an eye out for um, undue escalation in heart rate or blood pressure. We're checking repeat EKGs on folks, uh, monitoring symptoms that they experience afterwards, such as a headache or um, nausea, anything like that. And we're keeping an eye on um, symptoms around mental health, emotional health um, in the period of time following these dosing sessions, um, which has gone quite well in the three individuals that we've, that we've dosed so far. Uh, one of the ideas that I mentioned was we want to make sure that there isn't um, untoward interaction between psilocybin and buprenorphine. And on the whole, I, I mentioned that there was research done in individuals with a terminal cancer diagnosis, um, and psilocybin didn't seem to um, have an adverse interaction in, in that set of individuals, a number of whom were receiving opioids for purposes of managing their pain. Um, but we were less certain about buprenorphine, um, which is the active ingredient and in, uh, sort of the common brand name you may have heard of is Suboxone. Um, and the data you're seeing here from administering buprenorphine and psilocybin to mice uh, in Dr. Halberstadt's lab at UC San Diego. Um, and what you see here on the, the y-axis here is what they look at is head twitch response. Um, mice twitch their head very rapidly when experiencing the subjective effects of psilocybin. And you can see with increasing doses of buprenorphine, um, he was seeing less and less of that head twitch response. And so um, there's some work to be done here to kind of sort out the extent to which buprenorphine might interfere with potentially therapeutic effects and what sort of dose, therefore, might we need to be giving. Um, so I made mention of this already. We're uh, actively recruiting flyers in the community um, in locations uh, that we expect might be high yield in terms of uh, public use, presence of peer support, things like that. And um, the very, very sort of basic inclusion criteria you can see there, but I already mentioned um, another, a number of other considerations around ensuring safety in terms of cardiac health and, and mental health that you see in a little bit more detail here. Um, we are also keeping an eye out for any other substance use that might be challenging in um, combination with psilocybin. Primarily, we'd be thinking about stimulants there because psilocybin increases heart rate and blood pressure, and so does cocaine or methamphetamine. So if someone uh, has used any of those things recently, um, we'll want to have an eye to rescheduling that dosing session. Um, we're doing two dosing sessions, four weeks apart. Um, we give folks a bit of flexibility on what the second dose looks like. You see it can be 25 milligrams or 40 milligrams, and we base that decision on how, how well did the 25 milligram dose in terms of safety um, was it completely well tolerated with absolutely no indication of adverse effect, in which case we offer the option of going up to the 40 milligram dose? Um, one participant experienced quite a bit of nausea, some vomiting, and our advice was to uh, remain at the 25 milligram the second time around as, as, as an example. Um, and they were open to the second session, but at that reduced dose. Um, I mentioned serial EKGs that we look at to make sure that um, cardiac activity is uh, continuing to be normal. And then we're just checking a couple things to make sure that there isn't an interaction between buprenorphine and psilocybin where um, the buprenorphine level goes up to a point where maybe their breathing slows down. So we're checking blood oxygen saturation every hour and um, also double checking that they aren't having withdrawal symptoms um, where the buprenorphine level going down, but we haven't we haven't seen anything like that yet. Uh, I meant, made mention of overnight observation just to be on the safe side, um, though this has been done quite safely in the past. And so 
um, and other sites outside the United States. They're frequently discharging participants to home or communities, so that may be a consideration in studies coming up. And then um, we have ongoing monitoring to make sure they aren't they aren't experiencing adverse effects uh, going out from dosing day. Uh, and also looking at measures around substance use and are they feeling like um, re reducing their opioid use is something that they've been more or less successful with since entering the study. Uh, in other work, we're looking at psilocybin in the setting of methamphetamine use disorder. As you likely know, this has really been on the upswing in the last five years in particular in our state and particularly in our in our rural locations, um, and there isn't any uh, FDA approved and effective medication um, for methamphetamine use disorder. So this is a really active area of work, uh, just given how rapidly that's been escalating in the country. Um, there seems to be some preliminary evidence um, that I've already mentioned by way of psilocybin's potential effectiveness in the setting of use disorders. Uh, where in modern work that's focused again on alcohol use disorder and Johns Hopkins has done some studies as well in the setting of tobacco use disorder. So here we're also primarily at the current time looking at issues around safety, just making sure uh, folks who are using methamphetamine regularly um, are able to participate in the study. They're able to abstain from methamphetamine for a window of time prior to dosing day. And we're trying to sort out, you know, how we best support that and measure that to ensure safety um, for folks in that situation as well. And um, see how well we do at following up with folks after these two dosing sessions. Um, we're also, of course, keeping an eye on substance use during the course of participation. Uh, where we're hoping there'll be some signal around uh, reduction in use, reduction in craving or desire to use over the course of participation that we um, use some standardized measures to look at. Also looking at um, risk of use, like there are these standardized measures around drug and sexual behaviors that might increase risk for, for example, uh, bloodborne virus transmission. And so we're we're having a look at those as well to see if there's um, shifting on, on those behaviors as well. Um, in this study, we're also having a look at um, functional MRI um, that has a look at metabolic activity in different regions of the brain uh, before and after um, a supervised psilocybin session to see if we can get some further ideas about in individuals who look to be experiencing benefit in terms of substance use and craving what might be a neurobiological correlate with that in these functional imaging studies. So um, this is a more diagra diagrammatic representation of sort of folks flowing through the study that might help um, improve understanding there. So you see here the preparation that's that six to eight hours um, that they're interacting with our study coordinators and facilitators to prepare for dosing day and then they have an imaging study uh, the morning prior to receiving the dose. They're overnight in the CRU. They go through that integration session with their facilitators, and then um, the functional imaging is repeated. And then similar to our opioid use disorder study, there's this flexibility around whether they escalate dose or not um, for the second um, session determined by adverse effects and participant desire to do so or not. So, and that's what I have today for you. I will um, hand back. Amanda, I think you have a couple of housekeeping slides to go through here. Should we pause for questions first? Uh, let's pause for questions first. We just have a couple that came up in the chat. Oh, okay. um, I think you did talk about a couple of the settings, but if you want to just go through again formally, where is this done in Wisconsin? Um, so... University of Wisconsin in Madison um, is really the place where that's active in this work right now. And our current dosing room is in the School of Pharmacy. And then overnight stays are uh, on the clinical research unit um, at UW Hospital. Um, we're going to be expanding into um, a couple other studies where we may also be 
Uh, we may be needing more space for dosing sessions just because uh, getting participants through could create scheduling challenges. So we're working with uh, the sleep center. Um, they may have rooms where, where that could work out well, since at the sleep center, they're primarily occupied for evaluations at night. So we might be doing um, dosing sessions during the day there. Thank you. Um, and then there was a question, um, and maybe you could share just a little bit on your thoughts on credentialing and payments. Oh, yes. Great question. And there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done to sort that out. Um, and it's, you know, I've made mention of sort of all the things that we're doing in a research context to guarantee safety. Um, you know, and if you think about what reimbursement might need to look like for two mental health professionals to be in a room with someone for eight hours, um, we probably need to be doing a little more investigating around, um, you know, that model and whether that's really necessary. There are some folks that are looking at potentially group integration sessions um, that might facilitate um, greater feasibility there. But yes, to your point, all these things that are happening in a research context are probably going to be need to looked at need to be looked at a lot more closely when we're moving toward implementation once we get FDA approval for these compounds, which is probably about two or three years down the road. And then the third question that came up, um, did the city see any um, anything in relation to nicotine abstinence? So the, yeah, Johns Hopkins has done a lot of the work there. Matthew Johnson and Roland Griffiths um, are the folks that really spearheaded that work. And they're in their pilot study um, of 15 individuals with tobacco use disorder of at least 10 years duration and at least 10 failed quit attempts. They had abstinence rates of 80% at one year out, which you may know is roughly double the abstinent rates that are currently attributable to FDA approved pharmacotherapy. So yes, there have been some fairly dramatic results with tobacco. Um, and then uh, slides will be available uh, post session. I'll be talking through that in just a few minutes. Are there any other direct questions for Dr. Brown regarding the content? Feel free to type them in the chat or unmute. While you're thinking, um, I'm gonna go ahead and go through our ending session content. Please feel free to stay on, put your questions in, we'll keep working on them. And uh, if you'd like to stay after, we're happy to um, continue to, to answer those. Um, but as always, uh, if, you're if you've been with us before, you know the spiel. Um, if not, well, then this will be new and fun information for you. Um, if you've joined us through uh, another format, i.e. someone sent you the link um, and instead of just registering through us, that's fine, that's great, we love it. We're happy to have you, um, but we wanna make sure that we're able to contact you afterwards to make sure that you get the contact hours. So if you could just send us your full name and email address to our Great Lakes Extension contact email, that will be great. That means that we can get you uh, the contact hours certificate and it also allows us to make sure that you get added to our distribution list if you want to. Um, and then you can find out more about more training that we have coming up. I'm going to put some of our contact stuff into the chat there for you um, to make sure that you can stay in contact with us. That'll be our email, our website, and if you have technical assistance questions. It's a big part of what we do here is reach out to the communities in our six state region to help with some of those challenging questions that you have at the local level. The next thing I want to do is talk a little bit about um, post-session evaluation. I know sometimes that can get a little tedious, but hey, if you've got a couple of minutes to answer at least the first five questions, that helps us give feedback to our presenters. It also helps us determine what kind of professional development to queue up next for you, our virtual learning community, because heck, we love you. It's Valentine's Day. Um, we're really thinking about what to do for you. So help us help you. Um, make sure that you do that. Um, the, you can go ahead and throw up your phone and get the QR code. If not, if that doesn't work for you, then go ahead and 
hit the link that's in the chat. And we are ever so appreciative that you take the time to do that. Last but not least, February is a crazy busy month. If you've heard me say it before, you're going to hear me say it lots more. Um, we've got so much coming up in February. It is the launch of our Youth Mental Health and Social Success series. We are wildly excited about it. We hope you are too. Um, we have several series coming up. It starts this Wednesday with supporting authentic engagement, uh, communication and advocacy to enhance engagement, sorry. Um, it will start with Ms. Bina um, and a viewing of the This Is Not About Me um, documentary uh, by youth with lived experience followed by uh, our already running series, Know Your Resources. We'll have a presentation by Great Lakes Technology Transfer Center. Get to know your TTCs. They are awesome. Um, Jean Williams will be here. She's an awesome partner. She's great um, to chat with. So we hope that you will be on board to learn more from both of those running series. Thank you so much for being part of our session today. Um, I've got a couple of things that came in. Yeah. So a couple of uh, incredibly interesting topics. Thank you so much for the time to share. Uh, and then the second uh, next question that came in was how to select the drug for the disorder, MDMA versus uh, cyclosilabin. Yeah, and that's another place where there's some work yet to be done. Um, in the setting of MDMA uh, for PTSD, for example, there were some theoretic theoretical considerations uh, that led that direction in terms of um, the experience with MDMA being more entheogenic, there being sort of um, an ability to detach negative emotional impact from memory and be better able to engage in uh, therapeutic interaction. I alluded a lot to the fact that in the setting of psilocybin administration, the subjective effects are intense enough that there isn't really a lot to be done by way of directive psychotherapy. And that's less so the case in the setting of MDMA for PTSD, um, where some strides can be made during the course of dosing day uh, that have been fairly dramatic. Um, in fact, in um, phase three study of MDMA for PTSD just published last year, in individuals who met criteria for severe PTSD at study's end, people in the intervention arm no longer met clinical criteria for PTSD. Um, so fairly dramatic findings so far as that went there. Um, you know, and then beyond, you know, some of those early conditions, some theoretical considerations, um, there's simply, you know, doing the research that needs to happen. You know, we're still working on, you know, psilocybin for opioid use disorder, PTSD, there's getting to be interest in other compounds, um, such as active components. If you've heard of ayahuasca, um, 5-MeO and 5-MeO-DMT um, and other compounds. So there's still work to be done to really sort out um, where those different things are gonna land in terms of conditions that they might benefit. Uh, Randy, can... Uh, there was a question about whether or not tribes are involved in Wisconsin and how they're and how we're taking into consideration indigenous research based principles. Yeah, I saw that too. And I think another part of it was um, they were wondering about dosing sessions outside instead of in the treatment room. And that's one part of the question I want to address. And I'm really glad you asked about. It. I mean, part of the idea behind the set and setting and the interaction with facilitators is we think that may reduce the likelihood of adverse psychological effects, most specifically anxiety and paranoia, particularly when we're talking about um, populations where there's substance use and mental health comorbidity where um, risk from the get-go may be increased for having those um, sort of more adverse effects. In terms of indigenous communities though, and, and how this um, these practices have been done, that's really a fascinating area and one where I think people are actively thinking about um, that overlap and how practices on in one space might help inform the other, to be honest, that, um, you know, while, while People are talking about a lot. I think there's more to be learned on that front from from you know both of those spaces. Because to your point, 
yeah, there certainly could be advantage um, for appropriately selected folks in, in one situation or the other. Um, and then the last question that I see is, where was the PTSD research piece? Oh, where was, that was a very large multi-site international study. Um, those results were published in Nature Medicine last year. Um, I can probably grab um, that citation or the link to that super quick um, to get up there. And we can make sure that any additional links or resources um, can get added uh, to the post-event site too. Okay, I got it. Any other questions? Is therapy oh, needed? Ketamine therapy often needed. is used without it. And uh, and that's a question, right? And we don't know. You know, I talked a lot about set and setting, and research hasn't really been done to disentangle what is it that the compound is doing and what is it that interaction with the facilitators is doing. Um, so, yeah, because to your point, that's frequently happening with ketamine for depression without there being psychotherapy that goes along with it. So... Uh, we don't know. Thanks, Daniel. All right. If you have no further questions, we thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, if you do have further